And there's loads of things that can really upset your whole honeymoon when you're away. And that's the bugs and the bites and sunburn and all those things, which I'll go and try and cover now over the next couple, couple of minutes. One of the other problems that we have is that frequently one of the partners, typically the theme partner, doesn't have a clue where you're going on the honeymoon. That's a secret. And that makes it actually quite difficult for us because we're talking about vaccines. We're trying not to put our foot in it to say what vaccines you should have and shouldn't have when you're going to X or whatever X is. So if anyone's doing that, just bear, bear in mind, it's not the easiest thing to deal with when you're talking about vaccinations because obviously the vaccines are different when you're where you're going to in different areas through, throughout the world. Okay, I'm going to divide this into three sections. One is before you go, second while you're there, third is after you come back home again. One of the main things is if you have any underlying condition, typically asthmas or even diabetes or <coughs> epilepsy or any of these sort of things, they're not a contraindication to traveling as long as you actually know about it ahead of time. So one of the important things from our point of view is just to know if there is any underlying health issue with either of the two partners obviously involved in it. But it's not usually a major problem. Vaccine-wise, you can talk about vaccines that are required or recommended. Required vaccines are because you're going to an area of the world and they're worried that you might cause them problems. Recommended vaccines are because you're going to an area of the world where you can't bring anything with you, but you might pick up something when you get there. So you want to try and make sure you're covered against X, Y, Z, hepatitis A, typhoids, those sort of things. So the standard ones that are actually required might be yellow fever, sometimes meningitis for the Middle Eastern areas, very occasionally cholera. But ye yellow fever is the main one that might be required if you're going to one of the yellow fever countries. These are older maps of yellow fever. They've changed these now. These are the older ones. This is one of the newer ones for Africa and for South America. And they've actually changed it from the point of view, well, they've changed the colour apart from anything else, but they've also changed the um, areas. So some of the southern African areas down this area have now changed quite considerably. Whereas the central African areas, the Kenyans, and those sort of zones are still within the risk area. South America, as you can see, it's moving down towards the coast. It hasn't got there, but it is moving down towards the coast. So many of the South American destinations we would normally be recommending people do get yellow fever vaccine before the trip. Very much depends on what you're doing. Can I just ask around the group, I mean, do, do, do most people know where you're going at this point? No, yes, no, 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 so, so, all right, so the answer is no. So actually it's quite hard to, to be more specific, but if you have questions, ask me, I'll try and answer them. One of the other things about the yellow fever vaccine, it's one of the very few live vaccines that we use. And when you use a live vaccine, there are certain contraindications to using it, certain people that you shouldn't give it to. One of those is people are on steroids or immunosuppressed for any reason. And one reason people might be on steroids is because they have arthritic problems. Some of these rheumatoid arthritis are actually bowel disorders. So not only steroids, but the methotrexate, and those are immunosuppressive drugs. An immunosuppressive drug may make you at risk from, from the vaccine itself. So before you book any trips, if anybody's on any actual medication for some other condition, you should talk to us so that we can actually talk it through and see whether that might be a problem. One good thing about the vaccines is they last for ages. So obviously if you've had vaccines over the last couple of years, you may still be covered. But once you've finished the course, many of them last for ages. I mean, for instance, hep hepatitis A, when the, when the course is finished, it lasts for about 20, 25 years. Hep B should last for the rest of the person's life, which is brilliant. Hep B is now given to every child born in Ireland since 2008. So I mean, that's not you lot, obviously. But people who are born says we actually won't have this discussion in 10 or 15 years because they're all going to be covered because they've had it from their babies, which is great for the future. Um, and yellow fever vaccine, at the moment it lasts for a 10-year period, but in June of this year, the WHO and International Health Regulatory Body are getting together to agree to um, ratify that it actually lasts for the person's life. So if you've had a yellow fever vaccine two, two or three years ago, it isn't lasting for 10 years, it's lasting for life as of this, this point onwards, which is great and it's really good. So, so these are some of the issues that can cause problems, the bugs and the bites and everything else. And these are issues. One of the things, if you ever want to ruin a honeymoon, get sun, sunburned, I promise you. Can you imagine, I mean, it's an asset on slide, but this is a company set up. You know when you join a company, you're supposed to be an asset to that company? Well, this is little companies around. So you've got to be an asset, and I can probably promise you that is not being an asset to anybody concerned. And that happens in the first 24 hours. Forget the honeymoon, fellas. It's such a waste. Uh, it happened to me. I went to Acapulco. Didn't bring the wife. I should have brought her. She would have kept me straight. But I and I got a book. I unpacked the bag. I got a book. Went down beside the pool. Started reading the book. And fell asleep. Three hours later, I woke up. Just like, oh, Jesus Christ. No, no you spent like ten minutes. But the woman has to tell herself. Oh, it's so sore. Um, anyway, just please be careful because the sunburn is a big issue.
Not all things are stuck. stuck. I mean, your bowels are so important. The last thing you want to be is stuck in the loop. There is nothing worse than spending your holiday in the loop. And worse is you're sick for three days and then the partner's sick for three days. That's six days gone before you know where you are. The vomiting diary. I always, I mean, anyone who's heard my talks before will always know I spend my life giving off about the shellfish, mussels, oysters, clams, these things. Crab and lobster is quite safe because it's boiled. Fried prawn, fried shrimp, yeah, it should be okay because it's, it's well heated. Steamed mussels, oysters, clams, scallops, those things, they're not cooked. All you're doing is opening the shell to eat what's on the inside. If they've come from a sewage infested area, then they're going to be full of sewage and that's what you're eating, raw sewage, which is not really that good for your stomach. So they are a huge risk. Sushi is similar, sushi isn't cooked. So again, you're into the undercooked. And same with the red meat, you know, the medium rare, the bloody meat, etc., etc. That's just asking for trouble. In this part of the world, the risk is quite small. It's not that high. We do have some risk around the coast of Ireland occasionally. Down in Cork just recently, there was about 12 weeks ago, there was an outbreak of an E. coli infection into Cork Harbour, had to recall all their muscles and things. So it does happen in Ireland, but it typically happens overseas because the human population are full of bugs. That's what's going out into the sewage, into the sea, and that's where the shellfish are. Where you eat the shellfish doesn't make any difference whatsoever. It's where the shellfish came from is the important bit, not where you eat them. And I always think the five-star hotel is a bigger risk than the actual one-star. Five-star is a very good cook. He's probably French. And he, as soon as the, the shellfish are open, you know, they steam them until they open, then he takes them off, off the heat. The one star puts them on, forgets, goes off and does something else, and remembers 10, 15 minutes later, at least they've been cooked under them. So I would actually worry about the five star frequently more than I worry about the one star. But it's a bit of a balance. So please be careful. Food and water, absolutely crucial. And if you have a sensitive stomach in Ireland, well, you're bringing it with you, so you're still going to have a sensitive stomach wherever you go on your, on your trip. We always tell people to be careful of the tap water and not to use tap water, unless you can smell chlorine. If you can smell a good chlorine smell, probably okay to brush your teeth. I wouldn't drink it, I'd use bottled water, it's cheaper. Just make sure it is bottled water and not tap water in a bottle with super glue. You know the typical, they, they fill it up from a tap, put the lid back on, take out the super glue and stick it. But like in Sundog Millionaire, if you ever watch the film, there's a little section about that. So be careful of the water, buy it in the supermarket, buy it in a good hotel, it should be fine. The other thing is don't sing in the shower too much because the water goes into your mouth. Have you ever been up to your attic at home and looked into your attic here in Ireland? It's full of cockroaches and pigeons and all sorts of things. That's what you're using the water downstairs and the rest of your house as well. So if that happens here, how much more does it happen overseas? Food from street vendors, you're safer not to. Sometimes it is perfectly safe, of course it is. If they cook something straight ahead of you, well cooked, nice clean utensils, it should be okay. But how do you know for certain? It hasn't been reheated five or six times before you got there. And the other thing is the, the pastries, that wouldn't be safe. It's just not worth it. Again, anything cold, as much as it been out. By the way, when you go to the supermarket and buy your tomatoes, you know you buy open six nice tomatoes? Those are not the best six tomatoes. The person before you got a better six than you, because they came and touched everything before you touched them. And how many people have coughed into their hands before they touch all your tomatoes, etc. Okay, let's put you off tomatoes here and Ireland. But you, you, you understand the, the, the concept of it, at least. Just try and be careful. Mozzie bites, that's the other thing that can really, and this is almost anywhere in the world, including southern France, doesn't matter for Italy, France, Spain, doesn't matter, during the summer months there's plenty of mozzies buzzing around, even parts of Ireland, we've got the midges and stuff. Mozzies bite everyone, just some people react, some people don't. So if you have an allergy to the bite, that's a good sign, because that means that you know you're being bitten, so you know to be careful. People who don't think they're being bitten are the ones that are actually the higher risk, because they don't take care. So if you know you've, uh, you've an allergy and you know you're going to react, that's great. So if one person's been bitten, you are being bitten. You may not think it, but you are. But from the bite point of view, from the mozzie point of view, they're attracted by dark colours and they're attracted by smell. And smell is your perfumes, deodorant, aftershave, anything like that. That'll, that's all nice smell. That'll attract the mozzies. Perspiration smell, that attracts the mozzies. That's why they bite you around your ankles. Haven't changed your socks. And the third thing is too much repellent actually stinks. So that can attract them. So you don't wear too much, you only wear a small amount on the pulse point areas. You don't need to wear much of it. Just much less than you think. Just behind your ears, wrists, knees, elbows, ankles, those sort of areas. But don't cover your body in it. And don't counteract the repellent by having lovely shampoo that smells really nice. Because that smell. And again, that'll attract them towards you. So you want to be middle of the road as best you can. The non-perfume deodorants are actually an awful lot safer. That actually is quite important. 
Okay, Zika. I'm assuming you've heard about Zika over the last while, and it's been in the news so much over the last couple of months. This is a really difficult one. Why? Because we don't have answers. We've loads of questions. We just don't have the answers to some of the questions. And therefore, it's a bit of a hype at the moment. It's in the atmosphere. People are talking and worried about it. And is it a worry? It has to be a worry until we know it's not a worry, if you understand the logic of that. This thing called Guillain-Barre syndrome, you may have heard about. That's a, a, a neurological illness where you can't... You've, you lose sensation in your legs, etc., for a period of time. That occurs in Ireland, occurs in England, occurs in the States, occurs all over the world, associated with many viral conditions, which includes glandular fever here in Ireland. And yet, it's nothing to do with Zika whatsoever. So the fact that it is occurring in people with Zika doesn't actually mean that's a significant issue any more than any other viral condition does. And just for interest's sake, the arboviral conditions, these are viruses transmitted by arthropods, mosquitoes, ticks, those sort of things. The big ones, yellow fever, dengue, tick-borne encephalitis, Japanese, these are big ones, these are really serious ones. And then you get a whole lot of small ones, of which actually the least important for most situations is this uh, uh, Zika. It's actually probably the least important because it's the least sickening of all of the illnesses that are out there. When you look at what's actually happened in South America, most of the cases have been up here in the northeast corner of Brazil. Most of the micro um, cases have, have occurred. But it's also linked to two conditions, the guillain bar and the microcephalus, what I've just been talking about. And you look at the actual numbers of cases, this has been a huge jump in 2015. But if you look at the actual statistics, the confirmed cases are this little bottom one. These are the suspected cases. So there's a huge number of people who have been diagnosed as Zika, but on a clinical diagnosis, that's not confirmed. In other words, no actual blood test to confirm it. Just we think this person is Zika. So a colossal number of cases are not necessarily um, due to this illness at all. So it's going to be fascinating to see what happens over the next couple of months. But can I just mention from the microcephaly point of view, microcephaly is a normal abnormality. It occurs all over the world, including Ireland, including the States. In fact, in the States last year, it was 25,000 cases free um, ordered. Nothing to do with Zika whatsoever, just because it does happen. So even though you may hear of cases occurring, in somebody who's come back from Spain or whatever else. It doesn't necessarily mean it's from the Zika at all in the first place. So it is one of the issues that is a major concern. And therefore, what is the advice at this point in time? Now, this is at this point in time. Next week, next month, next year, it may change. But at this point in time, the advice for men and for women is going to be different. The advice <coughs> from the actual male point of view, if you've been to an area where there is recognized Zika transmission, look at that, many areas throughout the world. We've seen cases from Indonesia recently. So it does occur not just in South America, but if you're back from an area where there is a recognized problem, then you should use barrier contraception for about an actual one, one month period. If you did get symptoms that could be Zika, then they're recommending to keep to continue using the um, contraception for about a six month period, just to be sure, to be sure, to be sure, as much as anything else. From the female point of view, those who are pregnant, the advice is not to travel. Why push yourself to that extra risk, that worry, that concern, that anxiety? It's just not worth it at the end of the day until it's identified, is it a problem or is it not? It's just not worth it. So the people who are pregnant are just being advised not to actually travel to these areas throughout the world. People who want to become pregnant, this is the bad one. People who want to become pregnant, they're advising not to become pregnant for periods between one month and a two year period. And that is just to be sure, to be sure, to be sure. It's very Irish actually. <laughs> Maybe some Irish person wrote it. Okay, some of the other mosquito borne diseases. And malaria, it depends whereabouts you're going. I mean, most of you don't, don't know where you're going anyway, so, but obviously this depends on whereabouts you're traveling to. The uh, malaria tablets nowadays, when we are using them, we almost always use this one, uh, Malrone. Malrone's great, it hardly has any bad effects on it. One question is, when can you become pregnant after you finish the tablets? And the answer is from the actual Malrone, about three weeks after you leave the risk area. So about two weeks after you come off the tablets, it's only a short time from that point of view. After saying that, loads of people have got pregnant when they're on the tablets, and it's never caused problems. But when you have a choice, you prefer to wait for a couple of weeks. Um, these other ones can cause problems in some cases. The other about the vaccines, people ask how soon can you get pregnant after the vaccines? And again, a three month period is used, but that's just a figure. Loads of people are pregnant when they have the vaccines, don't even know they're pregnant. And that's never caused problems either. But we wouldn't, we prefer not to when we have a choice. Rabies, don't get near cats, dogs, monkeys, fairly obvious. But ladies, can I just remind you, monkeys are a warm-blooded animal. Please don't pick them up for the photograph. Because typically the fellow will tell you to pick up the motor funky for the photograph. And he bites you on the neck, and then you've got a problem. So please don't get near the animals, no matter where you are throughout the world. 
Jet lag isn't a major problem so long as you actually have enough rest for the first day or two when you arrive wherever you're going. So don't plan something that you arrive and suddenly start trying to see all the sights and everything else. Try and make sure, especially going from west to east, so heading towards the east, heading towards India and Southeast Asia, those areas, just let your body catch up with itself. Sun exposure I've mentioned. Obviously the whole um, dentistry end of things, if you have a sore tooth, get it dealt with before you travel. Don't obviously go off overseas with the, I mean, sorry, st stay away from the cats and the dogs, the monkeys, all those sort of things, obviously hugely important. People ask, should they bring a first aid kit? No, not very seldom. But we'd always suggest if you need the uh, malaria tablets, then you have to bring them. But bring tablets for diarrhea, bring tablets for nausea, bring your cream to treat mosquito bites, just so you have some little amount of stuff. Bring some paracetamol type stuff with you. Any personal med medications you're on, if you're on anything, make sure you have enough of that with you. Make sure you bring shoes and clothes that match the trip you're going on. If it's a hot trip, um, cotton clothing rather than synthetics, and obviously bring some talcum powder if you're somebody who gets pricky heat on a regular basis. And your feet will swell, so make sure you do bring shoes that are big enough because you're going to get blisters otherwise. We sometimes do give people antibiotics to bring with them. It depends on the trip they're going on. But the one problem with the antibiotic is we don't want you to take it without telling us what the problem is. There's a 24-7 cover, so if you're overseas and you're sick, then <coughs> ring us, send an email, and you may need to start the antibiotic. Usually we don't, but sometimes it's no harm to have one with you at the end of the day. Um, and the other thing that occurs on trips is the whole cystitis send of things. So I think it's worthwhile bringing KY, but whatever it is, just bring something with you, because cystitis is an absolute... I was going to say pain in the neck, but that's not quite correct, but I think you know what I mean. When you come back home, if you're sick with anything, whether it be fever, sweating, shivering, shaking, bowel problems, etc., that's when you really do need to get it checked out. Is it likely? No, most people don't have a problem, but some people do. So there is a 24-7 cover from our point of view, so obviously get back in touch and tell us what the problem is. The TMB website has a huge amount of information. Actually, it's too much because it puts people off their trip, apart from anything else. Got all the bad news reports up there on the news, and it's all the rotten things that are occurring throughout the world. But I think the vast majority of people will have a great trip and be perfectly healthy, perfectly well. The one thing back to what I said at the start is you need to be an asset, not a liability to the couple that you know, the, the couple of you. Because it does, if one person is messy, eating all the wrong foods and everything else, your head may want you to eat that food, but your stomach doesn't. So I'd always be careful of food and bites and sunburn and those sort of things. There is a, you know, you have to make sure that you're an asset to this partnership rather than a liability.